So yeah, my name is uh, Ian Stevenson, and uh, at the moment I'm teaching with the Centre for Adult and Continuing Education, which uh, is usually not quite such a formal setup as this. It's a lot more kind of interactive, and uh, the students will bring a lot of their own uh, experience to uh, to the discussions. Now, just I'd like to start off with a, a dis uh, disclaimer. Firstly, about uh, the pictures. Now, all of the pictures in the slideshow are my own, uh, but there's absolutely no connection between any of the pictures, the people or the places. There's no connection between those and uh, HIV AIDS at all. So that's just one disclaimer. The second one is, I'm not a medical doctor, I'm not a microbiologist, I'm not a pharmacologist, I'm a social scientist. But what I'd like to try and do today is maybe kind of give you an idea of what some people call the ecology of HIV AIDS, which is where the, uh, the kind of like the, the biological side of things interact with the environment and they interact with the social context and they then interact as well with behavioural factors. So I'm going to try and give you an idea of how all these different dimensions link up together. Uh, in particular in Sub-Saharan Africa. So the next slide which you've already had a, a sneak preview of is uh, some of the research partners that uh, were involved uh, with my fieldwork. So I was in the Department of Food Business and Development here. We were partnered up uh, for uh, many years with the Centre of Applied Social Sciences in the University of Zimbabwe until uh, my particular fieldwork on HIV AIDS the links have been more to do with community-based uh, natural resource management issues, which is what I've been looking at with my masters in Tanzania. And some of the photos are from Tanzania as well. So uh, I was able to visit different sites uh, that were part of an overall uh, integrated rural development programme, which was kind of administered by the University of Pretoria, but uh, the CAS in the University of Zimbabwe was the research branch, if you like, for that. And the funding for their, uh, their activities was coming from the Kellogg Foundation for the, the Integrated Rural Development Programme. And then the last three here are the different uh, community-based organisations that were uh, the gatekeepers for me. They were the people I would go and uh, meet up with and they'd introduce me to the communities that they were working in. So uh, that's Botswana Community-Based Organisation Network. Uh, ITDG Zimbabwe and the Bulalima Mangwe Community Development Trust in Zimbabwe as well. So, uh, a lot of these pictures, the only reason that the picture goes with the text is because where I could fit the words into the picture. But this particular is, is this one is just a kind of, uh, to kind of set the scene, if you like, uh, when we're talking about sub Saharan Africa, it's places south of the Sahara, doesn't include the Sudan and doesn't include the Maghreb or kind of Egypt and those kind of areas. But it does include Ethiopia and uh, Mali, Central African Republic, those kind of places. So anywhere south of the Sahara, all the way to South Africa, is what we generally refer to as Sub-Saharan Africa. And that's where I'll focus on. And in particular within that, uh, I'll be looking at Eastern and Southern Africa, which is where the, the kind of like the AIDS is having the greatest impact. So. There's just some, uh, the, the, the statistic of, uh, apart from South Africa, if you exclude those, the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa uh, is estimated to have the, the kind of buying power of a country equivalent of Norway. I don't know exactly what that figure is. It came from this book here, and I thought it was kind of interesting. There's a slide with the cover of this, uh, which I'll show you later on. But 1% of the world's wealth 10% of the world's population, but 70% of the burden of HIV AIDS. So, I hope these are readable. These are just some statistics from the latest uh, world report from UNAIDS. Uh, so, it, there's the numbers for 2009 in this column here. The numbers from 2001 are there. And then the yellow ones are the African figures and then the likely ones are the worldwide figures. So now this is where we can see that Africa accounts for roughly 70% of people living with HIV, 
Uh, again, roughly 70% of new infections each year. Uh, roughly 70% of age-related deaths and slightly more than that children, uh, number of children orphaned as a result of uh, members of the family succumbing to uh, AIDS. Okay. So the, the figure here of age-related deaths in Africa is now estimated to be lower than it was in 2001, which is a positive development. And there's quite a few positive developments in the last decade. Uh, there is an estimated peak at around halfway between 2001. Uh, at about 2004, they reckoned that in Africa there were 1.6 million age-related deaths in that year alone. But that was also the year that the antiretroviral drugs started to be rolled out and that has helped reduce the number of deaths. So the peak was estimated to be around 2004. So just in case you're not already aware, AIDS stands for Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome, and it's caused by HIV, which is a human immunodeficiency virus, which was kind of isolated in 1983 uh, in France, in the Pasteur Institute, by uh, Luc Montagnier and in America by uh, Robert Gallo of the National Cancer Institute. I believe he's come and given a presentation here in the past. So AIDS is a syndrome. It, what it is, it's uh, when people's immune system is really, really badly compromised, they become infected by uh, what are known as opportunistic infections. Now, often these result from uh, microorganisms that would live quite happily uh, within humans, but they don't cause illness unless the immune system is really, really, really badly compromised, in which case these things can cause deadly illnesses. Examples would be this PCP pneumonia and also the generalised uh, cytomegalovirus infection. So just a couple of examples. So, uh, after a certain number of years, the, uh, the viral load, which I'll come on to in a little bit, gets so strong that it, it cripples people's immune systems. Uh, it's usually taken like kind of uh, eight to ten years after initial infection. And then this is when people start to fall sick with these opportunistic infections. TB would be another one. Uh, and then they, they kind of progress to uh, what's described as AIDS or final stage AIDS. So uh, this figure here uh, is quite important. Worldwide, only 40% of people that are living with HIV know of their status. Do they know that they have been tested as HIV positive? So a lot of people have never been tested and not aware of their status. And that, uh, that's, the number of people that are aware has been increasing quite a lot recently since the introduction of the antiretroviral drugs because it does give people a reason to go and get tested. If the treatment isn't around, isn't available, people don't really have a reason to go and get tested. They're often afraid. Uh, of the responses of friends and family and acquaintances or even complete strangers uh, if their status was discovered. So people would rather not know. But when treatment has become available, it's been shown that this gives reason for people to go and get tested and to find out their, their HIV status. So uh, HIV is a retrovirus and you hear talk about the drugs being called anti-retroviral drugs. We'll come back to those a little bit later. But uh, Retroviruses were first described by Howard Tenney and himself and David Baltimore separately uh, uh, discovered the first transcriptase and for that they won a Nobel Prize in 1975. Now this reverse transcriptase is an enzyme that converts RNA into DNA which before their work wasn't thought to be possible. Okay. So that's when you hear of antiretroviral drugs this is the kind of thing that they're talking about. 
Okay, so this is a very garish cover of a book that I picked up uh, when I was kind of getting interested in the, the epidemiology or even the virology of the uh, HIV. So uh, I was kind of looking for a kind of good, reliable source because there's lots of different stories going around out there. And this was by a guy called Jack Goodsmith. Uh, he's professor of virology in the University of Amsterdam. And at the time that it was published, he was also chairperson of the Scientific Advisory Council, sorry, Advisory Committee of the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative. So it's quite old, but it, this was the, the kind of the, the way, it's very accessible uh, uh, book, and it's the way that I got into finding out more about the science and the, the history of the epidemic. Okay, so there are different types of uh, HIV virus. HIV-1 is the one that's most common. HIV-2 and HIV-0 are very, very rare. And they, the virus crossed over into people from uh, apes in Africa. Now, HIV-1 and HIV-0 seem to be from the kind of equatorial rainforest uh, in Cameroon and Gabon, around there and possibly from chimpanzees, from uh, scratches, bites, or from eating bushmeat. HIV-2 seems to come from sooty manga bays over further east, uh, sorry, further west in West Africa and Benin. But HIV-1 is the one that is predominant around the world. And there are different types of HIV-1. Uh, HIV-1B is the one that we know in Europe and North America. HIV-1C is the one that would be in Southern Africa. And HIV-1E is a, a variant that's now been found in uh, Asia, particularly around Thailand and places. So how do these different types uh, and subtypes come about? Well, the way that the HIV attacks people, how it attacks people's uh, body, how it gets into your system, is through uh, the CD4 molecules on these cells that are called T helper cells or helper T cells. Uh, well, they're also known as CD4 positive cells, and they're lymphocytes or white blood cells that are part of everybody's immune system. So the HIV uh, connects with the, the CD4 molecules on these white blood cells, these particular type of cells. And the purpose, kind of ironically, of these CD4 molecules is to recognize intruders into your uh, system, and then it alerts uh, other immune cells to come and fight off these uh, invaders. So it's quite ironic that the way that HIV attacks you is through part of your own immune system. And uh, a kind of side effect of this is that uh, when you're trying to fight off an infection, that activates the CD4 positive cells to replicate, and that then reproduces the virus in your system. So if you're attacked by other illnesses, that means that uh, the, CD, sorry, yeah, the CD4 positive cells will replicate and they'll, at the same time, they will replicate the virus. So now the, the virus can mutate and that's how you get these different subtypes and different strains within the different subtypes. And there's kind of three different elements to this. One is that when the, the virus reproduces, it's reproducing in millions, huge numbers of, of virus particles, virons, are uh, reproduced so you get this kind of uh, viral swarm, which is uh, a word, a phrase coined by uh, Howard Taylor. So then, while this is happening, you get inexact cloning, so you get different mutants uh, that are being reproduced, and the ones that are best adapted to survive in the host are the ones that will survive and carry on and then reproduce in the future. Ones that aren't very well adapted will disappear, they'll die off. But then there's this other aspect as well, which is where the, the name of this book, Viral Sex, comes from. And uh, this is about kind of recombination. So if you're infected by two different strains or even two different subtypes, at the same time, then there's a kind of a double process where uh, you can get two different strains, each uh, infect the same cell, and the two different lots of RNA come into the, the host cell, 
and then when that reproduces, you get three different types. You get two lots of RNA from one, one original virus, two lots from the other original virus, and then you get these ones that have an RNA strand from each of the two different viruses that are infecting the same cell. And then, as these then infect other cells, when they reproduce the next time, they, they kind of splice together different parts of each of the two RNAs. So you get very, very major changes, much more than uh, ones that would happen in kind of uh, animal evolution. They're like drastic mutations. And the ones of these that are the best fit to the environment, to the host, the ones that are the best adapted are the ones that will carry on, they'll survive, and they'll be the ones that are reproducing down the line. So these different, three different factors, uh, these are what gives the virus its flexibility in surviving in different environments, and how it crossed over from you know, ape species into uh, humanity, uh, and how it's kind of divided into different subtypes, each of which have diff multiple different strains, and it's what gives the virus its resilience. Okay? So, uh, the spread of HIV depends upon three different factors. The opportunity, which is the frequency of transmission events. So, the more that it's transmitted uh, from one host to another, the, the, kind of, the more virulent the virus becomes, the more dangerous it becomes. Uh, so, the, the second part then is the infectivity, which is what we call the viral load. It's the, the amount of virus that's in your bodily fluids. Okay? So that's the viral load. And so if uh, somebody's on the receiving partner, they, if the transmitting partner has very high viral load, the receiving partner will receive a very large dose of the virus in, in any one particular encounter. So that means that the, the person who's transmitting the virus, they have a high viral load, they're more infectious. And then the third thing is the susceptibility of the host cell. And later on, we'll look at how that can be affected negatively by malnutrition, which is a kind of crucial factor that I've been looking at. Okay, so there's two different kinds of risks that we're talking about when we're talking about the impact of, of HIV AIDS. Firstly, you've got the upstream risk of infection, becoming infected with HIV, and that's referred to as susceptibility. The second one would be the downstream risk, and that is people's vulnerability to the impact of somebody in their family, their household, becoming ill and passing away with age-related uh, illnesses. So the vulnerability is the kind of downstream knock-on effect to the wider family, the wider community, the wider country, the wider region. So, and like I say, susceptibility as well, it can also be, it can be used to describe individuals, but then also communities, countries, regions, that kind of thing. You can talk about kind of wider factors or you can focus down on the individual. So one of the things that uh, was key at the start was, you know, um, early on in the academic, uh, sorry, in the epidemic, which we sometimes call the pandemic now. I wasn't sure which one to put in there. So wealthy people were more susceptible to infection at early stages. Okay? And the reason for that is they're more likely to live in urban areas where it was concentrated originally. They were likely to be more mobile, so travelling to places where there might be more cases of infection than where they were living. They'd also have more disposable income to kind of go out, uh, kind of drink in bars or whatever. They were more likely to have multiple sexual partners and also to have more non-regular partners. So at the early stages, it was the kind of like the the kind of more well-off people uh, that were becoming infected and transmitting the infection. And this, just the, the next slide is kind of looking at a campaign uh, from Uganda that was focusing on using uh, kind of language and ideas that people were very familiar with in order to describe uh, this, the kind of a, a change in behaviour and a desired change in behaviour. Okay, so they called it zero grazing, and it's named after uh, an agricultural practice where uh, if people, especially people living in the mountains, may not have room to graze animals, so they keep the animals in 
uh, pens, barns, and they'd collect fodder and bring the fodder to the animals. And this system is known as zero grazing. And in Uganda, they use this well-known system to uh, get over to people the idea that kind of multiple simultaneous long-term partners was very uh, dangerous behaviour to have and that uh, you should kind of restrict. It's, it's kind of a difference uh, between maybe kind of behaviour patterns here or maybe not, I don't know. But people would often have more than one long-term partner and uh, that was a very big factor in the kind of spread of the virus. So zero grazing was named a campaign and that's just a picture of some uh, zero grazing practice there.